Monier, Monier, Monier. Uh, is here to speak to us and it is written. Amen. Welcome him. All right. Good morning, everyone. It is good to be here at the Central Church. Wow, I love your testimony. That brings a big smile on my face. Uh, you had my attention on that. Wow. So at what lesson are you at? You have reached number four. Good. So you're going to get to the good stuff soon. Amen. Excellent. I know, I know. You, you, you went a little longer than an hour. I'm just curious. So how long did it go? How long? Uh, it two and a half hours. Two and a half hours. <laughs> have mercy. Now that's the exception. And we, we allow the exception to take place. But usually speaking, when, uh, when you do give Bible studies, I agree with Karen that uh, it is wisest to go an hour or less because what happens is you want them to want us more rather than less and if we overstay uh, then uh, they're not going to look forward to our next coming however there are cases like Melvin where it does not matter as much they're so hungry for fellowship for friendship for for the Bible that uh, it does happen Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that there are many, many, many more Melvins out there. And it would be nice, it would be great if these Melvins would just come through the door of the church and just come on their own here. It would be nice. But the reality is, it just doesn't work like that. They're out there and we need to go and find them. There are thousands and thousands of them in the Phoenix area. They're searching, they're seeking, because they have looked everywhere. And the fact is, everywhere does not have the answer. The answer is only found in one place, and that is in Jesus Christ. And so, we must go out there, we must go into the street, and we must go to the neighborhoods, and we must go to the houses and find these people. So I'm very excited pastor that uh, this church is going to be doing a mailing uh, a, a bible study request card mailing in this community and uh, I, I don't know what you anticipate but our mega mailer the one that you'll be using uh, generally gets an average of about 10 per thousand responses what that means is for every thousand that you mail out about 10 people say yeah I would be interested in Bible studies. And that's a wonderful thing. So when you go to this person's home, like Karen has taught you, I'm sure that uh, she has done a thorough job here. And if, if uh, she hasn't yet, she will. But essentially, it means you go to the home with the card that they have mailed in, and you go with lesson number one, and you're there to deliver it. And uh, most people will be like, oh, I thought this was going to come by mail. That's usually the response you will get. And you will say, you know, I'm the local It Is Written representative. What are you? Local. Okay, I just want to make sure. The local It Is Written representative. And because this was such an important request, rather than trusted with the mail, I'm delivering it in person. We do it in person because, like you said, it's all about building that relationship. And the mail carrier does not have any interest in building a relationship with the people he delivers the mail with. Uh, so, but we do, because we want these wonderful souls around us to be part of the kingdom of God. So I, I, I am excited that you're going to be doing this, this mailing, and I think that God will bless. And I look forward, Pastor, to some of the responses, uh, some of the results that, uh, that you will have. So my name is Yves Monnier, and as you see it on the bulletin, that is a very, very, very strange name in the United States. And that's because my country of origin is not the United States. You might have picked up a slight accent. I've tried very hard to lose it, but it just won't leave. So I'm stuck with it. My mother tongue is French. And that's why I have a very, very French name. And that's because my home country is none other than, of course, not. 
not France. My dear sister here, of course, knows where I'm from originally. You know, there's other countries besides France that do speak French. Of course, you could go to Canada, or you could go to Belgium, or you could go to Luxembourg, or you could even go to some countries in Africa where French is also uh, their official language. But I'm from Europe. You can tell that I'm probably not from Africa. And my home country is actually a country where they have three uh, official languages, and that is Switzerland. Switzerland. In Switzerland, they, uh, in part of Switzerland, the majority of Swiss speak uh, German. Then there's a small section where they speak Italian. And I come from the part of Switzerland where they speak French. And that's, uh, that's uh, near the city of Geneva, if you've ever heard of Geneva. Now, if my parents had known that uh, uh, we were going to move to the United States when, uh, when I was born, they probably would not have called me Eve because, well, for obvious reasons. I'm sure they would have called me Miles. <laughs> no question. No question. That's what they would have called me. And so now for the last, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been a pastor for over 30 years, but for the last eight years I've been working with a ministry called It Is Written. And uh, as you might have heard a rumor, It Is Written is uh, partnering with uh, the churches in Phoenix, many of the churches in Phoenix, including the Central Church. And we're excited to be your partners in this journey, a journey which will culminate in a big series of meetings with Pastor John Bradshaw. And where will this series of meetings be? I'm just testing your, your knowledge. I'm, I actually, I'm not testing your knowledge. I'm testing your pastor because, uh, because the knowledge you have about what's coming comes from your pastor. So where is this series going to be held? Oh, you're getting an A plus at the Mesa Convention Center, and it starts on September 27. Now, September 27, 2019 feels like it's so far, far away. Well, it's only eight months away. And believe me, just like 2018 went by like that, we'll be on September 27 before you know it. And so it's important that we roll our sleeves because a, a harvest, because this is what this is going to be, a good harvest of souls only happens when you sow and when you cultivate. Have you ever tried to harvest a garden where you planted nothing? You will be disappointed. I guarantee you. But you harvest where you have planted your tomatoes. And you harvest where you planted your, your other vegetables. Your harvest where you have put some work into it. And that's the same thing that we're talking about. We're going to have a nice harvest in eight months. But uh, it all depends on us being used by the Holy Spirit. And I can tell that uh, the work has started here and more good things are going to take place. Well, before I get into the Word of God, let me do a little quiz. Just want to test your knowledge about it is written. Oh, I forgot to mention and I know the pastor did, but I, I want to affirm this. You want to hear Pastor John Bradshaw. He's here in the city in person, and there may be some of your church members who are not here because they've gone to listen to Pastor John Bradshaw at the Chandler Church. But no worries. I know you're, oh, we've got to hear this other fellow. But no worries. This afternoon at 2. Uh, John will be preaching at the Apache Junction Church. I know that's quite a ways. How far is that from here? 28 miles. 40, 48 miles. All right. Well, <laughs> I better finish quickly if you're going to make it there in time. I've got to go over there as well. John is, uh, is you know, part of the team, so I'll show up when I can. But no worries. Uh, a bit closer than Apache Junction. So let me recommend that one for sure. At Mesa Palms. I think that's, uh, that's a bit closer, right? Oh, come on. It's got to be closer. I looked at the map. I looked at the map. It's closer. All right. 38 miles from here. 
38 miles from here uh, at the Mesa Palms Church at 5 p.m. I really want to encourage you to be there. It's, uh, it's, it's the climax of a great weekend that it is written as spending here in your midst. So John started last night at, at Mesa Palms. This morning he was at the Tempe Church, the Chandler Church, then the Apache Junction Church, and then the grand finale again will be back at the Mesa Palms Church. So I hope that I'll see some of you there. It's going to be a great finale. You are going to be blessed. Are you ready for the quiz? Real quick here. So, I just want to see if you know a little bit about it is written. Who, who was the very first, the founder, the, the first director, speaker director of It Is Written? Anyone know? Elder George Vandeman. Absolutely. I remember moving to the United States and listening to Pastor George Vanderman on Sunday mornings at it, it, on It Is Written. Never thought that one day I would be part of the ministry. It's like, wow, I'm, I'm still sometimes wondering, God, you would want me to be part of It Is Written? That's, that's pretty amazing. But I remember watching him on Sunday mornings and his words would just flow out like honey, just soft-spoken and yet very, very powerful. This was an easy question, though. Let me ask a, a, a second question. Uh, in what year was It Is Written founded? Mmm. Mmm. Making you think a little bit. Okay, I haven't heard the right year. I heard 1960s. No. 48. No. Maybe go in between. Ah, Pastor Miles Reiner. Pastor Reiner is really, really close. Very hot. 1950, he said 55, six. six, good job. So this year we are celebrating our 63rd anniversary and, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's, we're glad to be doing this anniversary with, with you here in Phoenix. Anyway, let's bow our heads for prayer, and then we'll go right into the Word of God. Father God, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath here in Phoenix. And like has been already prayed and requested, just continue to fill us with your sweet, wonderful Spirit. And I pray that the few words I will share will not be my own, but will be yours, and they will touch our hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen. I should have asked you one more question. I, I should have asked you one more question. And I will do it now. And that will get me going here. It doesn't take much to get me going. The purpose, the mission, the driving force. And I'm not talking about an individual. Um, I'm talking about what it is written is all about. Can be summed up into one single word. And what is that? Sure, it's Jesus. I'm not talking about a person. I'm talking about evangelism. There you have it. Boy, 1956, evangelism. You're on the roll here. You're on the roll. Wonderful. Evangelism, it is written, has always been about evangelism. When George Vanderman started in 1956, you know, he looked around and he said, you know, he, he was an evangelist and he says, you know, What's a better way to reach more people? And he said, you know, we should use television. We should be on television. We need to broadcast to the masses. It was all about evangelism. And that's why a lot of people today, when they're thinking about evangelism, they're looking around and they're saying, how can I reach more people? And that's why we have many who are into social media because social media in this day and age is certainly a powerful way to reach a lot of people in diverse parts of the world. So it is written has always been about evangelism. Uh, we've really never, never went away from this mission. Uh, we didn't want to be just another program, another ministry that is a feel-good thing. You know, come and listen to us and when you listen to us you'll feel good about life. Uh, we, we want people to be connected to Jesus Christ and to discover that Jesus has a clear will for your life. Now, people will sometimes ask, 
Why are you so driven by evangelism? Why always evangelism? Can't you do something else besides evangelism? You know, here you're coming to Phoenix and you're all about evangelism. Why, why, why? Well, the answer is actually pretty simple. Uh, it's because uh, Jesus told us to, to do evangelism. And that should be a good enough reason to just do it, right? However, I've discovered a long time ago that to do something just because someone tells us sometimes cannot be satisfying. It's like me telling my children, eat your broccoli. And they would ask why, and I would answer as any good father would answer. I would tell them, because I said so. And fathers and mothers, isn't that a good reason why our children should do what we tell them to do? However, we know very well that when we are not looking and when they grow up and leave the house, uh, are they going to keep eating broccoli? Probably not. So you want them to eat broccoli or you want your children to do certain things, not just simply because daddy said so, but because it's something they have internalized in their lives and truly believe. So, yeah, I could say we do evangelism because Jesus said so, but I, I hope and I think it's, it's because of something. Oh, let me get my computer to collaborate here. I hope it's, it's more than that. Every time I'm, uh, I travel back to my home country of Switzerland, I go visit a cemetery. And on a very specific tombstone in that cemetery is what I believe the answer to why we do evangelism is found. Now, before I, I tell you about what is written on that tombstone, let me tell you who's buried right underneath that tombstone. And I think you probably will guess who it is. It would be my parents, my mom and dad. My mom and dad were, you know, someone has referred to their generation, uh, if, if, you, if you can recall, as the greatest generation of all. You know, that's the generation that lived through World War II and... Uh, and these were people, and some of you might be part, are part of that generation. They uh, survived the war, the great war in Europe. And uh, as committed Seventh-day Adventist Christians, they accepted the call to be missionaries. Now let me tell you about my parents and, and the Lord's work. Where he called, they would go. No questions asked. If he calls us, we're going to go. And when they arrive, that's when they would begin to ask the questions. I don't know if you've noticed, but things are a little bit different these days. When someone is asked to serve in a spe specific capacity, there's a flurry of questions ahead of time. Uh, or they will say, I need to pray about it, which essentially also means this is code name for we need to look at the housing costs and we need to look at the cost of living where we're called to serve. Uh, we, we, we need to do some research, make sure that it's the right thing for our family. So a lot of questions have happened before anything happens. Not my parents. Not a lot of people in that, in that generation. If God calls, we trust Him, He will provide. And they just would march on. And when they retired, do you think they really retired from the Lord's work? Are you kidding me? I, I'll just give you a little glimpse into my mother. 92, and she passed at, at 92 and about 10 days short of her 93rd birthday, but well into her 90s, uh, she was still making her phone calls. This was evangelism to her, Friday afternoon. Friday afternoon, she would sit on her uh, lazy boy, and she had her phone right next to her. This was an old-fashioned phone. This was one that is still connected to the wall. 
I know we, we, you know, kids today have no idea what I could be talking about. What? A phone connected to the wall? What on earth is that? All we know is a phone that goes with us wherever we go. So she would lift the, 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 the handset there and, and put it to her ear, and then she would push the buttons, and she had her list of people she would call one after another. And these people were people that she ministered to. Now, she could not walk well and drive well, but boy, she was still very sharp and she could talk very well with a little accent, of course, French accent. And she would call these dear people and encourage them and, and pray with them and, and, and minister to them. And also she would remind them, and don't forget to come to church tomorrow. I hope to see you. And I would say, Mom, Mom, why, why do you make these phone calls? You don't have to anymore. You can just relax. And she says, no, no, this is, this is my ministry. Evangelism was in her blood. It was in my parents' blood. So now let's go to the tombstone, which answers the question, why did my parents serve the Lord without question? to their very last breath, you could say. Why would they do that? And the answer is on that tombstone. So there are their names, Samuel and Yvonne Meunier. Of course, their dates, birth and death. And then there is three more words with a Bible text attached to it why they did evangelism. That text is found in Romans. I invite you to open your Bibles or your phones. That works just as well. By the way, to have your, your Bible on your phone is a great tool when you go door to door, when you encounter people wherever. You might not have the book with you, but you actually have the book with you. So have it ready. So Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, verse 14. It's the first three words of that text in French. Now in English, it would be a little different. It would be the first four words. I'll say it to you in French, and then I'll read it in the English. The three words that appear on that tombstone where my parents are buried are the words, Je me dois. In English, I read, I am a what? I am a debtor. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I like the wording in French better. Not all the time. You know, you read some text in a different language, and in that language, it just feels stronger, and more powerful, and, and more insightful. I think this is the case in French. It's, it's good. I am a debtor. But je me dois means I am. Oh, it. I, I like that better. What does that mean? Well, let me read the rest of the text. These are the words of Paul, and it's also the reason why he traveled everywhere he could and suffered so much as you read about his life. He said, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, or we could say, wherever you call me. Paul, the Apostle Paul, is indebted to the world because he has experienced this thing called salvation. And just like my parents, and just like countless others, just like many of you here, Salvation does something in your heart. It, 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 it doesn't leave you quite the same. Uh, notice the words. I'm reading just a, the, the next verse here, verse 16. He said, he, he kind of elaborates on what he means. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto what? unto salvation, unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now notice verse 17. For in it, or therein, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, 
as, oh, I like the next three words. Ah, you caught it. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Salvation is what Paul experienced on the road to Damascus. And because of the immense sacrifice of Jesus Christ on his behalf, and not just on his behalf, but on all of our behalfs, it, it, it just changed everything. It just changed his, his, his approach and direction in, lives, in life. It gave him a whole new outlook. Now let me share with you the examples from a couple of men in history, just so you understand what I mean. Have you ever heard of William Carey? He is considered by many as the father of Protestant mission. Now, in his life, he went through a conversion experience. You can read about it. As a young man, he, he, he kind of left God, but then came back. And when he came back, when he experienced this thing called what? Salvation. It just gave him a whole new outlook. And he decided, you know, I am indebted. I owe it to God to share Jesus with other people. And where did he go? If you read the story of William Carey, you'll read that he headed to India. India. It's quite a story. I'm really summing it up here. He went to India, and, uh, and he went to work. Now, notice what happened there. After six years of teaching, after six years of preaching, after six years of connecting with people in India, not one Indian had come to Jesus. Six years, and the result is zero. Now, people back home are saying, back in England, are saying, you know, William, it's just not working out. You should simply get back on the boat and come back to England because you're just not cutting it. It's, it's it, your failure, essentially. But William Carey did not do this. He said, no, no, I'm going to keep going. And what happened next is a great story. Thousands and ten thousands and more came into believing in Jesus Christ because of the commitment of William Carey. Why did he do this? And if you read his story, you'll see that he endured a lot of hardships. It was hard life because he was indebted. He experienced salvation. Let me mention another one here, another great missionary. His name is Adoniram Judson. Ever heard, hear of him? Now, some of you here will appreciate this maybe a little bit more. He went to a country called Burma. Anybody here from Burma? No? Right there. So Adoniram Judson went to Burma, and I know we have some from Burma in other rooms, correct? Now, he also went through a conversion experience, walked away from God, but then came back. And by the way, all these men that I'm mentioning here, William Carey, uh, Adinaram Judson, they were young people who ended up going overseas. So we're not talking about these old missionaries uh, long beards, white beards, white hair. No, these are young people who spend most of their lives overseas. So after a conversion experience where he experienced the same thing as, as William Carey, and that is salvation, I am indebted, I have to share Jesus. He originally wanted to go where, where William Carey was. He wanted to go to India, but the doors closed, and so he looked around, and he ended up in Burma. Now, listen to this. This might surprise you. During his four decades in Burma, how many decades? How many years? 40, 40 years. Judson led around, listen carefully, led around 25, you finish, 25. Twenty-five people to the Lord. Twenty-five people. No, I, you know, when I, I read this, and I'm saying 25, 40 years, you would have expected, you know, 2,500 maybe, 25,000, but 25, that's all, 25. 
And, and, and when I read a little bit more of the story, it said here, perhaps only 10 of these displayed a real living faith in Christ. So even of the 25, not all of those were really committed. But it's after he died that the work really took off, the work that he started. Today, I understand that there are over 3 million Christians in Burma as a result of, of his work. I'm not talking about Seventh-day Adventist Christians. I'm talking about Christians. All of this because he felt indebted because he had experienced salvation. Have you experienced salvation? We begin to really experience salvation when we realize how big of trouble we're in. You know, and sometimes preachers and others fail to point that out. We're quick to go into the hope and the good news, and we fail to help people understand we are in big trouble. Let me explain to you how big our trouble is by giving you this illustration. In Gainesville, Georgia, there is a man, uh, or there was a man, I, you know, this story is a few years old, but by the name of Len Geiger. Remember this name, Len Geiger. He was a runner. He was an athlete. He was a, a sportsman. He was an outdoorsy type of person. He, he, he would swim. He would run. He would bike. And he was a non-smoker. So he was into healthy stuff. Well, one day it happened. He, he felt like he could not breathe well. His lungs were, were not functioning the way he was used to. And he thought maybe he had a cold or something. And uh, it would go away or maybe some some allergy, but it did not go away. It only got worse. And so when, when you start having some health problems, who do you visit? Your doctor. He wants to visit his doctor, and the doctor said, mm, mm, mm. And he says, you better go talk to a pulmon pulmonologist. Got to say it right here. Uh, you, you better go see someone who is an expert in, in lungs. And so he went to see a, a, uh, this specialist, and they ran a battery of tests, and uh, the doctor said, let me, let me talk to you in my office. Ladies and gentlemen, when, uh, when the doctor says, let me talk to you in the office, that's usually not the best of news. And so he was, uh, he was a little worried. He sat there, and the doctor said, well, let me, let me tell you what's going on. We have uh, discovered that what you have is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. I know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, what on earth is that? And I'm sure he was like, what on earth is that? It's, it's a very serious disease that attacks the lungs. So he asked the question that, uh, that you and I would have asked, and he said, well, okay, so what's the cure? What's the treatment? Uh, what medication do I need to take? And that's when the doctor got even more serious. He says, there is no cure. There's no medication, no pill that you can take. The only thing that will save you is a miracle. Bottom line, Len, you're dying. <coughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, remind you, that what we have is spiritual alpha-1 antitrypsin. And ladies and gentlemen, there's no cure for this. Absolutely no cure. There's nothing you can do to, to, to fix it. Uh, you can't wake up in the morning and say, today, and uh, by the way, th this, this, this condition is called sin. Okay, sin. But today, I'm not going to sin. And we probably uh, have all tried that. Today, I am not going to have any bad thoughts. Today, I'm going to keep my mind pure. Today, when I'm driving, I will not allow any stinking driver. Oh, uh, I slept already. You can't do it. You can't do it. We're sinners. And... And it's, it's, it's pretty serious because the Bible tells us that uh, the wages of sin is what? Death. Is death. And it's not just death as 
the end of life, not death like this brother who just passed away this morning. That's the end of life. We're talking about death as in the eternal death, the, the death from which there is no resurrection at all. So we can all agree here, we have a very, very serious problem. And the only solution to our sin condition is a miracle. A miracle, just like what Len Geiger was hoping for his life. And there was a miracle. I am glad to tell you, and you know it well, the king of the universe, king of all galaxies, look up tonight. I know it's hard to look up and see how far the, the sky goes in the city because the city is so bright. But you drive out a little bit ways into the desert where it's dark, really dark, and you look up. I live in a place that is a little bit more like that. And, and I walk in the, at night sometimes and I look up and it's just like so awesome, so phenomenal. You look at the starry skies, it has no end. Our Lord is the king of all galaxies. And this great king of ours, this here is the miracle. You know, we hear about miracles on earth all the time. But the greatest miracle of all, bar none, is Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, coming to planet earth for 33 years, living as a humble man who was so despised by others. It, it just, every time I think about this, it just blows my mind away that he was willing to become nothing for our sake. You know, think about this. So many people around us, when they reach a certain status, they want everyone to know, I have reached a certain status. You know what I'm talking about. They, they walk a certain way and they talk a certain way and, and they want everyone to know, no, no, I'm, I'm a I'm doctor. Or, you know, they sign their emails uh, with all of their initials that follow, THD, MD, PhD, you name it, demon. You know, it's, it's, it's a message. You know, I am, I am someone. And yet the one who really was someone is someone. Came and became no one. Think about that. He came to this planet of ours. What did he do? First John chapter 1, verse 7. I like how you do this here. You're so quick. Thank you, brother. First John chapter 1, verse 7. I'm just going to wait on you. You've got it here. There we go. It's coming. It's coming. There it is. Oh, there it is. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. But here's the part I want to emphasize. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So Jesus Christ lived a perfect life for 33 years. And then finally, at the end, he paid the price because the wages of sin is death. So he died our death. He, he died the second death. And the blood that he shed, what does it do? It cleanses us from all sin. Now, I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about what it means, all sin. Have you ever done that? I, I did this just for the fun of it. I, I kind of did some calculations here, and I'll give you some numbers. And so bear with me. If you're not into numbers, I ask your forgiveness. I'm not really into numbers, but uh, I was just too curious. So someone has, has calculated that uh, the earth since the very beginning till now has had about 107 billion people that has lived on planet earth. Okay, that's a lot of people. 107 billion. Right now, there is how many? 7.5 or 6 billion. But when you add up all the people of all generations of history, 107 billion people. So I did the math. And then, okay, let's say that... Uh, that they all committed, uh, I picked a number out of the blue, 15 sins a day. And some of you may say, well, that's too many for me. Or some of you may say, well, that's not enough. So, but let's go along with 15 sins a day. And let's say that the life expectancy, I came up with a 55-year life expectancy. I know in the United States it's far higher today, but when you count 
all history, you know that in older his, in times, uh, the life expectancy was a bit less, quite a bit less. So I just came up with 55 years. So I did all the math. I multiplied, da, 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 da. And would you believe, here's the number that I came up in terms of how many sins that would add up. Are you ready? 30 quadrillion sins. 30 quadrillion sins. Now, if you're wondering what, what that stands for, it's three, 30 with 15 zeros behind it. Is that a lot of sins? And let's go back to our text. I, I, I like that text. Let's just linger there, my friend. Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. I mean, just think about this. He paid the price for 30 quadrillion sins and I'm thinking that probably that's a conservative number it probably is higher now let me make this a little bit more personal because you know that's a general statement about about planet earth what about you what about me how much do we contribute so let's follow the same principle 15 sins per day we probably sin more than we realize some of you are saying Wow, uh, no, not me. But let's go along with it. Just bear with me. So let's say an ordinary person, life expectancy, I checked it, for the United States is about 79 years. 79, 80. Uh, that's 28,835 days, 15 sins a day, so you do the multiplication. So that would add up for a lifetime of 432,525 sins. 432,525 sins. That's what we potentially contribute to the 30 quadrillion. Now, I want you to really think about this. You know, sometimes we, we just think about sin in general, but that's, that's a big load. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. His blood, His sacrifice, cleanses us from uh, uh, 432,525 sins. Praise the Lord! Hallelujah! When, when, when Jesus comes into our lives, His blood cleanses us of, of all these sins, and when the Father looks at us, He does not see all those sins, but He sees Jesus Christ. I, I really like what uh, the prophet Micah says, uh, and I think you'll appreciate it. Micah chapter 7, verse 19, it tells us that our sins will go where? Do you remember that text? Our sins go in a very specific place. It goes into the depths of the sea. I don't know if you've ever looked at a documentary that talks about the fish, not the ones near the top, but the ones at the bottom. Because there are fish way down there. If you ever Google, I, I encourage you, if you ever do a little search, maybe not now, but later on, Google fish deep sea. I mean, we're talking way down there. And uh, they've been able to send some cameras down there and, and, and take some photos. Have mercy, they would say in the South. Have mercy. Those fish are the ugliest things that you have, could ever look at. I mean... We're talking downright scary. You're thinking, you could be thinking, they come from a horror movie. They're so ugly and so scary looking. Just horrible. I have a theory about why they look so bad. And you know what that theory is. Where do those things, sins, our sins, all of our sins go when we, they go where? They go to the depths of the sea. And, uh, you know, no wonder those poor fish look so ugly. That's what sin does. I, I think the best way to, to, to illustrate 
to describe the miracle of Jesus Christ cleansing us from all sin. That miracle, I think, is best summed up by Ellen White in the book Desire of Ages. Is it okay to read the Desire of Ages here? Page 25, it's a, it's a text you've, you've, you've heard. It says, Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins, in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness, in which he had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. With his stripes we are healed. Brothers and sisters, that is the description of this awesome miracle. This awesome miracle, salvation. Now let me, let me finish with a, a powerful article I read a few years ago, written by a uh, sports writer. Sports writers, they write about football, and they, especially these days. And they write about, about baseball. That's coming soon here too. Phoenix, I know, is a mecca of baseball in the spring. And they write about basketball and all sorts of things. Rarely do they write about what I'm going to read here. But this time, Rick Riley did write something a little different. And uh, it's, it's, it's a blessing. And it relates to what we're talking about here. One day, a beautiful young lady, he writes, her name, Corinne Schroyer, came home from eighth grade. Anybody here from in eighth grade? Any eighth graders here? No eighth graders? You're in eighth grade? Okay. Very good. How old are you? Fourteen. Listen carefully. She came home from school, found her father's revolver in his closet, and fired a bullet into her skull. Fourteen-year-old, eighth grader. Out of a million kids, you'd pick Corinne last to commit suicide. She was a popular kid in her class in Lynchburg, Virginia. But then she started feeling sad for no reason, and one thing led to another. The pain of the parents was unbelievable and beyond understanding, and we can all <laughs> imagine that, as they watched their daughter hang on to life on life support for six days. In other words, the bullet did not kill her outright, but put her in a state that she needed life support. <sighs> when it became obvious that the brain, her brain was no longer functioning, Mr. and Mrs. Schroyer, her parents, decided to send out her organs like gifts. Her green eyes would go in one direction, her glad heart in another, her kidneys still to another, her liver and her pancreas went somewhere else, and her two good lungs went to a Gainesville, Georgia man named Len Geiger. Remember? Alpha-1, antitrypsin, the only thing that will save you is a, is a miracle. The only way to save Len Geiger was a miracle. I read on here, Rick Riley, a lung transplant. He waited for five years, five years, and had almost lost all hope. To the point, keep in mind how serious this is, he could not talk and walk at the same time. He did not have breath for both. Either he could talk and not move, or walk but not talk. Just imagine, that's, that's pretty bad. He had almost lost all hope for survival when Corinne pulled that trigger. Geiger received those two young lungs six days later in an operation at the University of Virginia Medical Center. And that's when the story gets good, because so far it's not been good, but it gets good. Geiger at that time in his late 40s went from 15, 1.5% lung function to way above average for his age. He got his second wind, second wind, and his second life. He was so grateful. Another way, word for grateful could be the word indebted. That's right, indebted. He was so indebted that he couldn't help himself. He wrote Corinne's parents to say thank you, and that letter changed everybody's lives. Corinne's parents wrote back, and Geiger asked to meet. And next thing you knew, Geiger was at a bittersweet gathering that became soaked with every kind of tears. The Schroyers and their other daughter, Colby, now 16, gave Geiger a photo album of the girl whose life was now breathing inside of him. 
He writes, this is Len Geiger's own words, she starts out as this beautiful baby, then she's a little girl in a Halloween costume, this gorgeous teenager, and then the pictures just stop. It was the saddest thing I've ever experienced, he writes. Hours later, the group was parting when Christy, Corinne's mother, said, Len, before you go, can I ask you a favor? She walked over and stood before him, and he said, yeah, sure, anything. Can I put my hands on your chest for a second? And she stood there crying as she felt her dead daughter breathe with every breath he took. And not only that, she heard her daughter breathe as well. Rick Riley finishes the article by saying, Sometimes life just takes your breath away, doesn't it? Jesus took our breath away when he replaced our miserable lives with his. And thanks to his sacrifice, we have a new wind. Thanks to his sacrifice, we have a new life. And because of his sacrifice, we are indebted. And when you feel that indebtedness in your heart, it should change the outlook of your life. You can't look at other people quite the same way because you owe it to Jesus. What drove the Apostle Paul to travel the known world as he did and suffer innumerable uh, hardships? I'm indebted. Why did my parents go wherever they were called? And to their last breath, were thinking about other people. They were indebted. Why did Adinaram Judson go to Burma? And William Carey go to India? And why are we doing what we're doing here in Phoenix? Because we are indebted. So what are you going to do? You know, if you truly have experienced salvation, and I hope you have, and if you haven't, please connect with your pastor because he will be more than glad to talk to you and walk you through the beautiful message of the gospel. But when you've truly experienced salvation and you feel that indebtedness, it just changes everything around you. There's thousands of people here in Phoenix that are not interested in God. And that's okay. Well, actually, it's not okay. But there is equally thousands and thousands who are wanting more. And we need to go find them. We need to go find them. And why do we do it? Because we have experienced salvation and we want to find them. So when that mailing goes out and we get, how many are you mailing, Pastor? Well, let's say you mail 3,000. I'm just giving you a number out of the blue. It could be less, it could be more. But uh, you could have, let's say for 3,000, you could have about 30 people saying, yes, I would be interested. Now, that's, that's quite a few people, 30. Pastor is just one person. He needs some help. I hope he can count on you and you and you and all of you to go out. And what drives you to do it? Well, I hope it's not because, well, the pastor made me do it. (laughs) I hope you do it because when you experience salvation, you feel that indebtedness coming from deep in your heart. Thank you, Jesus. I must do, I must do what you have called me to do. I look forward to what God is going to do in our midst here. And I look forward to the harvest, the great harvest that God is going to be doing here in October this year. Let us pray. Father God, it's been good to hang out with my brothers and sisters here at the Central Church, the Phoenix Central Church. Lord, thank you for the beautiful testimony that I heard this morning. And Lord, I know there's many more, many more that will also take place in the weeks and months to come. Lord, bless this church, and I pray that everyone here will respond to the invitation to serve you, to do evangelism in all of its facets, not because, oh, 
I've got to, but because, man, I can't help myself. I owe it to Jesus who paid the price, who gave his life for me for all of my thousands and thousands and thousands of sin. I can't help myself. I want others to experience the joy, the blessed hope that I have. So, Lord, just, just move everyone here into, into action, I pray. And Lord, as we part now, I also also ask that you may bless the food that we're going to enjoy together as a church family. Thank you for today. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.